Moving along to the second uh, vignette, and time's moving right down the trail. We've got four to, to give you, and they're all just excellent, uh, excellent, uh, I think, uh, useful things, practical things. If you look over in your outline again to um, page eight, the second vignette to, to present to you is one that I think you're going to find uh, very intriguing. I was uh, intrigued by it. I can't say that necessarily had it come up unlike the first vignette, but this one is something that uh, can teach not only Lawyers have certainly taught this judge a thing or two. Um, or maybe I just relearned it. I don't think I've ever, I think what I'm doing now is just relearning what I've already been told four or five times. But this opinion deals with judicial records and the word judicial notice. Um, there's a, this is a boundary line dispute. Um, and um, boy, don't we love those cases. Um, there's two individuals involved. Counts and Mullins have had a raging boundary line dispute. And in 2010, Counts brought the suit against Mullins. It was a declaratory judgment format as well as a request for an injunction establishing the boundary line, which is certainly one of the popular ways for the boundary line dispute to be raised. This was in a case, uh, as again, filed in 2010. And after a trial, the court ruled in favor of the plaintiff Counts and enjoined Mullins from further trespass, okay? That, that was that. End of case? Of course not. Uh, like uh, child custody cases, boundary line disputes go on and on and on. And in 2012, counsel again brought a suit. Same plaintiff brought a suit against the same defendant. This, is, this time it was not a, a suit for declaratory judgment and an injunction, but this one was a suit for damages from, from trespasses, okay? The suit in 2012 followed the ruling in the other case in 2010, a separate suit, same court, same parties, same piece of property, alleging that in the damages for the trespass, that the trespasses occurred in 2009, remembering that the other case, the first case was decided in 2010, as well as another trespass in 2011, which would have been after that date. Um, Mullins, defendant, filed a plea of race to cop uh, as to the claim for damages uh, in the second suit, uh, at least the damages in 2009, the ground that that claim should have been included in the prior suit. Um, counts, of course, was not just satisfied to file the suit, separate suit. Counts also secured a rule to show cause in the 2010 case against Mullins for having violated the court's injunction when he trespassed in 2011. Now, because the lawyers were the same, the parties were the same, the court was the same, the motion for the motion for the plea of race judicata that is filed by uh, Mullins' counsel um, and the rule of show cause were set for hearing on the same day. Got those two scenarios going on with me. So the counts present will be presenting the motion for rule to show cause. Um, Mullins, of course, will be presenting the plea of race to the cop. All right. Now, Mary Lynn, you represent uh, I represent Mr. Counts. All right. Please proceed with your presentation on the motion for rule to show cause for the uh, violation of the court's injunction order 2018. Thank you, Your Honor. As you know, I represent the plaintiff, uh, Roger Mullins Counts, in this case. Um, Mr. Counts um, has put on evidence um, just before lunch, as Your Honor heard, indicating that there was a trespass by Mr. Mullins very recently on his property. Uh, that trespass was in violation prior order of this court, and we therefore have filed a motion to show cause why Mr. Mullins should not be held in contempt. And at this time, based on the evidence, we, we believe he should be. Um, but in order to complete our evidence, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of the prior record and the order in this case, in which Your Honor ordered that his trespassing cease. All right. 
That order was entered on what date, uh, Council? That was in 2010. And I have that document here within the file, is that correct? Yes, sir. We are here on case number 10-251. Uh, we uh, uh, had that file delivered up from the clerk's office and we here in, and the order has a yellow tab on it in your file, and that is the order on which we ask that you take judicial notice for the purpose of issuing this rule to show cause. All right. Mr. Massey, you represent Mr. Mullins, is that correct? I object, Judge. Uh, we're here on a motion for a rule to show cause, and this is an evidentiary motion. And it requires proper proof, and there's been no proper, proper proof of the prior order, so I object. That objection is overruled. Mr. Mullins, sir, uh, yes, sir. make yourself comfortable. I need to ask you for the bailiff's uh, purposes, just what size are you? I mean to. Okay. Well, we'll see if, how well you look in orange, sir. Mr. Massey, do you have a motion uh, with regard to uh, the new matter of case that's uh, been recently filed? Uh, do I understand you have a Argument to present on your plea of race to the county? Uh, yes, Your Honor. All right, proceed. Uh, may it please the court, we're here now in case number 12 143. And that is the new matter, is that correct? That's correct. All right, that's the new matter filed with regard to trespasses that are alleged to have taken place in 2009 and 2011. Yes, sir. All right, proceed. And as the court is aware, this is a suit for money damages. Alleges two trespasses, one in 2009, one in 2011. Your Honor's decision and order was in 2010. A special plea that we filed goes to the claim for trespass in 2009 during the pendency of the prior case. So, this is a claim that was in existence during the prior case. Was not included in the prior case. There was no claim for money damages. It's a claim that clearly arises from the same conduct, transaction, or occurrence. So it's within Rule 1, colon 6, and this claim is barred. And in support of my motion, I want to offer a copy of the final order in case number 10 251. Is there objection, counsel? Yes, Your Honor. We object to the offer of the final order because it has not been properly authenticated. Is this the same document that I just was presented in the other matter? It is, Your Honor, but that makes no difference in this particular case. <coughs> Mr. Massey, sir, your request is denied. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Judge, I don't understand. <laughs> I just said it was the same order. Mr. Massey, you said you got to be kidding me, Judge. <laughs> yes, Counselor, I understood that too. And, uh, Mr. Massey, Mr. Massey, you be careful, or both you and your client will be together in contempt. Do you, have, do you have any more evidence or argument, Mr. Massey? Can you explain why you just took judicial notice of it in the prior case and won't look at it here when I have a copy of it? Mr. Massey, uh, the objections have been made to the document by counsel. That objection is being sustained on the grounds that it was made, and your request is, with all due respect, denied. I'll let you wear my suit. <laughs> I think they're close to the same size. <laughs> all right. How about that? Kind of amazing, isn't it? This the very document that the court accepted, um, less than five minutes later, the court says, it ain't here. I can't take it. You understand why that is? Then, wait. The, uh, the case law regarding orders and the court taking judicial notice of orders provides that the order can be noticed judicially, but only if it's an order in the pending case. In that case. So if it's an order in the case, the judge can take judicial notice of the order 
meeting where the judge is being asked to take judicial notice of an order in a prior case, um, then it, that is not a part of the record in the case in which the court is being asked to notice it. That is not permitted in the absence of authentication. And um, we, we've seen people in the courthouse before say, uh, judge, excuse me, let me run down to the clerk's office. Um, so there are fixes to this. Uh, it, are confronted with that situation. And they're easy, but they are time consuming, and not every judge. We have some in, in decades in the past who would not let you take a brief recess and go to the clerk's office. Um, so you have to walk in. If you need the court to take judicial notice of an order that's not in your pending case, in which you need the order noticed, you simply go to the clerk's office, get a copy, and get it attested. It's all it takes. Couldn't Wade just take a non-suit? Well, as defense counsel, I don't think that's a tool. Well, it's, it's not available to defense counsel. But he's stuck. If he asks the judge for time and the judge says no, whoops, it goes by. But as plaintiff's counsel, if you can't get the continuance, you've got to stand up and say, I'd like to take a non-suit. Get very nauseous for good reasons and ask for a recess. Right. And, and, and again, here's the point that was similar to one of the things brought out in the first vignette, and that is, you know, you, you, you want a chicken cordon bleu, go ahead and try to make some chicken salad out of it. You'd be standing there thinking, be prepared, and your lawyers, your thinkers, uh, don't, uh, don't be shy about saying, okay, I, I see what's happening here, you know. Wade would never react in the fashion that he did. You know, the, the, the vignette that actually was written for the lawyer to say, are you kidding me? I mean, goodness gracious, it's a lie. That may be what you say inside. Well, and you need, you need to know that, that Wade felt so strongly about not personally saying that to Judge Kirksey that I had to intervene because it's, it's something that would not <coughs> Absolutely not. not. But, you just wouldn't do that, but at the same time be thinking about, well, what, what do I do next year? This is not coming in, something's not happening. Yeah, I can appeal the court, but you know, appeal's what you don't want to do. You want to figure out another way to get it in. And as Lynn said, you say, can I take a brief recess and, and, and go down and, and get the, uh, the record authenticated with, this, with an attestation? Or even you can say to the court, may I call the clerk as a witness, please? And the court's going to say, okay, you know, that's cumbersome. You don't have to have the clerk there. All you got to have is a, you know, an attested copy of that order, and you know you can get that quicker than disrupting the clerk, bring her in. But that'd be another way to buy some time, as Roger says, to that judge that might be saying, "No, by God, you only got ten minutes. I'm going to hold you to it." Well, then say, "Well, I need your clerk. Can you just please have the clerk call her with that file?" And maybe then that would bring the court to its senses. Um, the authorities that you that you have in front of you and are in your, your outline, the Williams case. Uh, from 2011, a recent uh, case from the Virginia Court of Appeals, 57 Virginia Court, Virginia Appeals 750, uh, talks about records within your own file. The file of the issue that is, you don't need the judge to, to don't, need, don't, need, don't need to authenticate what the judge has already got before him in that very file. But in the other files you do, and that's where you find the, the opinion in, is stated in Fleming versus Anderson, a uh, Supreme Court case, an old law, old law's good law, I'm told, 1948 case, 187 Virginia, 788. And of course, uh, also uh, reaffirmed more lately, in, you know, 49 years, 39 years later, Taylor versus Commonwealth at 28 Virginia Appeals 1, uh, with respect to what you have to do taking judicial notice of documents that are not within that very file. Yeah, and, yeah, yes. One comment. Uh, you might be aware of if you were to have an order in that other file that doesn't have the judge's signature on it, and he go get a copy test and it doesn't have the judge's signature on it. Could you get that in the record? Well, there is a Virginia case that says yes, and it's Wangi versus Commonwealth. 51 Virginia Act 498 that says oh, as long as it is authenticated by the clerk, that's all that's required to get it into evidence. 
even without the judge's signature. Interesting. Any observations, comments, uh, concerns by the members of the bar or members of the bench? Yes, sir. John Bundy. Judge, I just want to know who represented these people like the one of the shot the Say that again for the microphone's sake. I wanted to know which one of those represented the other one. <laughs> Anthony got shot when this case was up. <laughs> <laughs> well, being a boundary line dispute, you know that the, at some point in time there's a great likelihood that it's going to take itself elsewhere. Well, I must have been the shooter because <laughs> you're here. <laughs> Always and elevators away from the chambers of the court, and not many judges would, would grant you um, leave to, to do something like that under such serious circumstances. So, preparation, yeah. preparation, and no influence. The John's comment as well about the emotions and how they are raging. I found three categories of cases uh, over the years that uh, fire up emotions uh, of individuals. Of course, boundary line disputes with one of those. We're also aware of how emotions will flare when it comes with regard to child custody cases. Uh, you know, courthouse security, I've always told my bailiffs, uh, don't, don't be so concerned about the high level criminal case. Be more concerned about things like boundary line disputes, as innocuous as that sounds, or, or the, the child custody uh, issues. And the third category, for some reason, and I've had several of these, I still get chided about one of them I wrote on early on and took off Judge Lowe's uh, plate, and that has to do with their dogs. By well, golly, you mess with somebody's dog and somebody don't get hurt, and, uh, or cat as it is. Uh, killed the cat, a dog killed a cat, and I'm still catching the devil over that one. Uh, even saw your good party friend as it was, and he was still chiding me about how I made his, he paid for that, that cat. Um, Judge? Yes. Um, just one other uh, subtle thing about this. Uh, actually, offering that order may not be enough to sustain your plea of res judicata, even if the judge look at it. Uh, there's some authority that you need to bring the whole record of the prior case to the court's attention. That would mean assembling at least the critical documents in that prior record, like the complaint, which may bear on res judicata, as well as the final order. Yeah, and uh, you know, a well crafted final order could be very helpful as well in that situation, Wade. And uh, um, some of you are just outstanding when it comes to including specific findings within your order that knowing something and anticipating where things are going to be so that that issue might be something of use. And um, with all due respect to everyone that's here, there's one individual who's unfortunately has left us, uh, not just practice, but has left this earth, uh, uh, our dear friend uh, John Tate. Uh, I've never seen a lawyer that can write an order like John Tate can write an order. Um, he was just marvelous at including those details that need to be within the order that could be so useful and pertinent when an issue came up in, in uh, future times, uh, as it would be. Uh, so uh, I even had John, he was such a gracious individual. Normally we point to the winner of the case to write the order, almost always, that John was in the case, win or lose, I'd say, John, can I prevail upon you to write the order? And he even then would not flinch and say whatever the court wishes. Um, um, consummate gentleman, an excellent attorney, and, and I know he's missed by a lot of folks. Uh, let's move along to the uh, third vignette. We're not going to get to the fourth one. I'll tell you that the fourth one is a delightful vignette as well. Roger Mullins can talk to you extensively about that vignette. It has to do with Carfax and all sorts of interesting information that comes up. Very applicable in some of your practices with regard to going after somebody that's frauding somebody. Uh, and uh, We're not going to get to it, obviously, for the time we have remaining, but we do want to get to the, the third vignette, and this vignette is likewise quite interesting and, and very uh, timely. Uh, this is found on page 13 of your uh, outline and the, uh, the, the matters involve Ford Motor Company. And uh, um, you know, 
Ford Motor Company has been the target of some very interesting litigation, uh, products liability cases that have come out of Virginia's uh, courts. Uh, a very recent decision in January of this year, I don't know if my colleagues from the Supreme Court are here yet, uh, I know they're coming. Um, Justice McClanahan, uh, Justice Kenser, um, no one? Okay, now we can talk about it. The 2013 case is really going to have some interesting things for you to see. In all seriousness, this vignette is, in, is a product liability case, and if you look at page 13, uh, with regard to the vignette, Phelps brought a product liability case against Ford for injuries sustained uh, when an engine in the car stalled during its normal operation, and the stall uh, resulted in Phelps not having any power steering, braking, or anything of the sort, unable to control the car, and Phelps was terribly, horribly injured. Phelps contends that Ford failed to warn of the dangers associated with this engine stalling, and to prove notice, as if you know is well required in products liability cases of this defect, Phelps, the plaintiff, wanted to introduce records involving prior complaints of the engine stalling uh, to Ford. All of the records were, were made or kept by Ford, as made or kept by Ford in the regular course of business. Ford opposes introduction of the records on several grounds, um, including uh, that the letters contain uh, certain things, uh, uh, consumers describing other accidents, this consumer's actually describing complaint letters, if you will. Some of the letters even were so self-serving they said they were dangerous and unsafe. Um, the letters uh, do not describe events that were observed by Ford employees. Instead, they describe those of others. And uh, Phelps has failed to show that other stalls were caused by the same defect or as, as the stall in this case. Um, also, Ford says if they come in, of course, Ford doesn't want this in. Ford wants a limiting instruction informing the jury that these other complaints cannot be considered as proof that the vehicle involved in the present case, the Phelps case, was defective, only that Ford had notice of other incidents as it would be. Phelps is calling Ford custodian as an adverse witness in an attempt to introduce those documents. And I've got a rule on those objections. Counsel? The, uh, the plaintiff calls uh, Roger Mullins, who is the custodian of records. Is this the same Dr. Mullins that I had in the previous case? No, Your Honor, that was Roger Sutherland. Okay, Roger Sutherland, excuse me. You're under oath, Mr. Mullins. Please proceed, Counsel. Good morning, Mr. Mullins. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Um, tell me your full name, please. Roger Mullins. And where are you employed, Mr. Mullins? Ford Motor Company. And Ford Motor Company is the defendant in this case? As far as I know. And uh, you know Mr. Massey, counsel uh, for Ford Motor Company, seated by you? Oh, yes, he prepared me for today. Uh, I want to uh, ask you some questions about your job at Ford Motor Company. What do you do? Oh, I, uh, I'm in the safety division, and I keep uh, records of uh, things that are involving safety issues with the products. As I understand it, then you are the records custodian. That's correct. And you are charged with maintaining custody of complaints sent to Ford Motor Company regarding problems with Ford vehicles, is that correct? Absolutely. And your job includes being custodian of records involving complaints about the Windstar. Excuse me, Judge, but this witness is not adverse. I object to the leading witness throughout this. Your Honor, we believe that any employee of the company uh, has a relationship that would make his uh, testimony adverse to the uh, Objection is over. Proceed. Mr. Mullins, I believe my last question was, you also keep uh, the records regarding complaints about the Wind Star. Is that correct? That's correct. And have you custody of
Yes. And you, do you understand the circumstances involving the case in this suit? Not really, just that there was a fire in the front part of the... Yes, I think that's correct. So let's go back to the complaints about the Windstar engine stalling the documents. You have that folder in front of you, correct? Just a minute, let me check. Oh yes, yes, I, I recognize that. That was that was a little bit different than the other. And in, in this folder that I've given to you, you have seven complaints. Excuse me, excuse me. I don't mean to interrupt on your prior ruling. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Madison. But until the documents are admitted, I don't think it's proper for counsel to describe them as if they were admitted. So I object. Um, your objection is uh, sustained on the, on, on the basis of Tom Scott's civil procedure rules. <laughs> Are you comfortable to the file? 
is for the records to be admitted as uh, exhibits, is that correct? All right, Mr. Massey, the Sword Council, what is your position? Judge, we object on three grounds. Number one, the records contain opinions as to the safety of vehicles of other users, and thus their hearsay under Rule 2, 8036. Number two, the records describe events not observed by four employees, but by others, and are hearsay under the same rule. Number three, the records do not show the cause of the other incidents, or that the other incidents were caused by the same alleged defect as is argued in this case. And therefore, the records are not missing not admissible as a matter of products by Middleton Law in Virginia. Counsel? Your Honor, we have responses to all three of those objections. With respect to opinions, um, Mr. Mullins had my request, and I have reviewed that as carefully redacted opinions with respect to the complaints of consumers to the effect that these vehicles are dangerous. Those have been taken out of these documents. There are no opinions left. Um, secondly, he uh, objects based on the absence of observations of these events by other employees. There's no requirement under the business records exception that these documents uh, recount events that have been observed by other employees. In fact, it's the company's protocol to maintain adverse event reports, um, both for their own record keeping and they're required to maintain. So observation is simply not required. And there's been no challenge to the foundation we play that these are regularly kept to trust the worthy uh, business records. With respect to the final objection, counsel objects that these do not allege the same defect. That's not required under Virginia law. It's our understanding that we can't do some relevant cases that the records are invisible. Thank you, Council. Mr. Massey, sir. Um, Judge, we, we tender the records for you to examine, but we stand on our objection. Well, Mr. Massey, that's a lucid, uh, intelligent, <laughs> well thought out objection. Mr. Massey. Thank you, Judge. Overruled. The uh, time is running a little short, so we'll, we'll stop at this point in time and, and, and dive into what you heard, what you saw, and I know it was a little tedious factually uh, to you, but uh, certainly you have to read and reread and reread two cases, uh, what, what's sometimes referred to as Ford 1 and Ford 2, or Ford versus Phelps, which is 41, and uh, Ford 2, which is Funkhauser versus Ford, uh, both are from our Supreme Court, one in 1990, uh, that being uh, Ford versus Phelps, Ford one, that's in 239, 239 Virginia 272, a 4 3 decision by our Supreme Court, even in 1990. Our Supreme Court, more prone now, it seems to have uh, some division and even some dissenting opinions, as it would be. Uh, Funkhauser versus Ford took place. Um, the last version of it, I should say. Also a 4-3 decision. That ruling uh, took place in January of this year. It's a 285 Virginia 272 uh, where Funkhauser versus Ford was decided. As I say, it is a 4-3 decision with a very uh, interesting dissenting opinion that's been written, very active dissent of being written. This is the case that some of you will remember that, that something very unusual happened most unusual, to my knowledge. The uh, Funkhauser case was initially decided and announced as an opinion by the Supreme Court in June of last year. Um, yet uh, that opinion in June of last year was withdrawn by the court uh, after a petition.
petition for rehearing was granted. Uh, and the decision they made, our Supreme Court Justice made, as I see them arriving now, it's good to see you. <laughs> oh dear. Should I say that they gave heavy reconsideration to their decision in June that went 4 3 one way and decided it 4 3 differently after the rehearing? Incredible decision. Very, very interesting analysis. Very succinct decision. Uh, with uh, what has happened in that case. Uh, any comments that you wish to make on this before we have to go to break?